Hey everyone, uh, Cam at Inky Knuckles here, uh, joining you with a couple uh, very special guests this lovely Wednesday evening, Mr. Troy Nixie and Mr. Matthew Allison. How are you guys doing? Very well. I guess I'm not really a special guest anymore. I'm kind of more of a co-host by these, you know, at this point. So it's Matt, Matt that is the the special guest again. Are you the right. the Andy Richter or the Ed McMahon? Um, I is, there, like, is there a Canadian? Are you you're uh, um, William B. <laughs> Sammy Motley? <laughs> <laughs> or Paul Schaefer, maybe I'll yeah. pull out the keyboards. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I think I'm gonna I think wave I'm, color sunglasses. <laughs> I'm being relegated to kind of producer, and Troy's the host. So okay. No, uh, it's it's definitely your show. I'm I'm just the <laughs> I'm just the guy riding shotgun with the map, so who talks a lot. That's why I'm here. <laughs> no, I it, uh, happy we could do this. I know we planned it for a little while planning some things with the live stream too that we want to take care of but i'm glad we both are you guys were both able to uh hop on tonight and we lined this up so um before we get into too much because i know we want to talk commissions we want to talk hank or uh, a bunch of things typically i ask uh, a few questions of the folks um just to kick off some conversation and what I wanted to ask you guys was uh, pertaining to commissions, uh, two part question, and we'll just, we'll try to go first and then Matt can hop on after. Um, one is how are you guys enjoying uh, the, the commission game? How, how is your general approach? Obviously we'll get more to that later. Um, and two is who specifically, and you can't say each other, are, are doing oh, really... <laughs> really eye-catching uh, commission work these days because I know, as I mentioned to you guys before, there's some, some very cool things going on in the original art world, specifically with commissions right now. Talked about it, Mike Mignola's doing some pieces. He did all those eBay pencil pieces. Walter Simonson took a list. I think um, Jim Mafood, uh, Sean Crystal, you know, guys like that are doing amazing work and you two are both at the forefront of that. Um, this, this kind of revolution in, in crazy commission work. So, um, yeah, two-part question. Troy, uh, you're up. Well, it's, I'm loving it. It's, it's interesting in that, um, and it's going to sound super arrogant, but it, it's just what it is, is that I felt with these commission pieces, especially the last three, uh, that I sort of found a new gear that I didn't know I had. And it's really opened my eyes in terms of where I think I can now push this stuff. So mm -hmm. every piece now is really considered and and I thank you know the, the people for their patience and, and waiting for commissions. I you know I'm not rushing through anything. Um, and so it's it's as a result it's a little slower, but as I'm learning this and seeing where I think I can take it, I'm really excited. Like I'm really excited for creating um, probably the most I've been in years. And also as a result of that, because commissions are paying the bills, it's allowed me to be more experimental with my comic work, because I'm not gonna turn my back on that, obviously. And it has really let me just explore things that I wouldn't have explored in the past and just really leaning into the weird stuff that I like doing. And uh, so, yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. It's been really eye opening for me and, and really enjoying it. And uh, you know, as for that, so this for me is what sort of set me in the new direction. Um, I kind of went into this a little blind in terms of executing the inks. And so I just jumped in and, for whatever reason, I always start in the bottom left-hand corner of these things. Just so I just do. I don't know. It's not on purpose. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, it just started working out, and it's like okay, I know where I can push this now. And uh, to me, that's really exciting. I mean, you want to you want to keep. I talk about this a lot endlessly sometimes about raising your ceiling, pushing your ceiling, you know, and and, and trying to get as as good as you can and. And um, so that's what I'm trying now. That's what I'm trying to do now. 
And as for artists who really blow me away, because it, it has sort of made me more aware, or like take more notice of people who are doing commissions. Uh, you know, Ian Bertram is is doing amazing stuff, especially his artist choice stuff, because he's just doing this really kind of experimental, figurative stuff that is just incredible. And it, and so and that pushes me too. You know, like it pushes me to to try new things and and. Uh, um, to think of think of it as a whole, move beyond the idea of of a commission being a pinup. Like it can be its own piece um, that doesn't really have to be connected to anything else. And and of course, you know, you can't. You told me I can't say Matt, but I'm going to anyways. I really I really see what Matt's doing, and sometimes it makes me really mad. <laughs> <laughs> because they're so amazing. Like his HP Lovecraft piece, I was I told him to go f himself. Like you know, obviously in the best way possible, because it was it was so good, and it spurs me on. Like it spurs me on to want to get better and better and better. So I'm I'm sticking to that. Well, that's um, you know right back at you because the the level that you've reached with these pieces and, and the piece that Cam just showed. Um, it's eye opening because I think I had a pretty narrow view of what commissions should be. Um, you know, I, 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 it's not something I personally collect. So I, I, I only really pay attention when it's pushed in front of my face. You know, somebody says, Hey, yeah, look, I got this or, you know, somebody I follow on social media posts uh, a commission that they received. And um, you just, you know, you store this idea in your head of what that should look like. And you're not doing that. And you mentioned Ian uh, Bertram, and it's the same with him. He's doing things that feel wrong in the sense that they're pure expression. Mm -hmm. uh, the The but it's filled with care and craft and a sense of design and uh, storytelling. That's, that's a crucial element. Uh, you know, that, that piece that Cam just showed, um, those guys are going someplace. Yeah. It's not just two people standing there. They're in, either in the middle of a race or they're off to a race. Who are they racing? I want to know. I want to, I want the rest of that story. And I think that's, that's a, a, a crucial element of commissions that that I certainly didn't think about and, and some other people may not think about either is you can tell a story with this. You can, you can have it be a piece of a story. It's, Absolutely. it looks like a double page spread from a comic book. And that's very satisfying to me to, to see that type of work. Um, well, and to, and, and, I, and not to belittle or put down anyone else who's doing commissions, but I think that, that what Matt, you know, I'll include you in this, Matt, that you and I are striving for is, you know, we're not creating pieces that people put in a folder. Like we, I, me, I want to create a piece that people go and get framed and hang on the wall. Ho hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Like that yeah. is amazing. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, I got online and I was looking for photo reference of HP Lovecraft of his face. I knew he had a very long face yeah, uh, but I was seeing multiple drawings, multiple paintings where it was him with tentacles coming around his neck, and that was where, where my mind had gone initially. It was like, oh, there's got to be tentacles, which, in a way, there has to be. Yeah. Um, so the question was, well, how do you how do you do something new and interesting with that? And hopefully, I did that. Um, I, I was fairly satisfied with the results on that one. Um, pretty and also being, uh, you know, not very well versed in H.P. Lovecraft's writing, so I, I had wished that I had had more of a, an immediate response of, "Ooh, I have to do this particular story, something yeah. from that." I, I don't really have that background. I've only read a few of his stories, so I really did have to rely on visual reference. Now, but do you think that if you had been really immersed in H.P. Lovecraft, that perhaps you would have felt a little beholden to? some images that that immediately popped to your mind because surprisingly to some, I'm actually not an HP Lovecraft guy at all. Uh -huh. uh, so you tackling this 
the way that you did and it's succeeding at the level that it does, I think is as a result of you not being really special about H.P. Lovecraft, you know, not holding it dear. Well, I think my hope would be that if I was well-versed, if I had read more of his work, I could find uh, the, the deep cuts, so to speak, find elements, uh, creatures or scenarios that aren't the Cthulhu-based um uh, you know, stuff that, that you normally see. I know yeah. that, that that stuff is out there. Uh, you know, my, my reference really for, for Lovecraft is uh, uh, the movies Reanimator and From Beyond. Mm. So this to me is almost my From Beyond type piece. I was actually going to do the, the pituitary gland or whatever it is that comes out of the head, but I didn't <laughs> want to make a direct reference to that. Plus with the way I split it, I couldn't really do that. Now, the idea of splitting it, uh, is that something that you, that immediately came to mind for you? Or was this after doing a bunch of sketches and, and you know, you deciding after looking at some H.P. Lovecraft images, it's like, oh, I don't want to do him just draped in tentacles because a lot of that already exists. How did it sort of take shape? Uh, the splitting was, came from the desire to do panels within a commission. Uh, you know, what I would like to do one day is do basically a one page story as a mm -hmm. commission. I think that would be pretty cool. So this was my first baby steps into that, basically creating a, a two panel uh, page, essentially. And it's and it's interesting with uh, um, with sort of breaking it up like that. And because and I, too, have kicked around the idea of like doing a one page, just like something from a book. Mm -hmm. um, that you've, you know, you've found this original page in a stack of something and you're like, yeah. where did this come from? And, you know, and building everything from the ground up, I think that would be oh, a yeah, lot yeah. of fun. So um, when you're working on, and I guess we've just jumped right into the <laughs> interview portion of the, of the, of the live, the, the live stream, but when you're working on a commission and, you know, when Cam reaches out and says, Hey, I got a guy and he's interested in, you know, da, 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 whatever it is. Are you finding that you immediately get an image in your head sometimes? Like, boom, I know exactly what I'm gonna do. Or is it always a process for you? Well, I mean, first off, half of what I've done so far, I would say about half has been cover recreations. Mm -hmm. So that part of it is taken care of right off the bat. I don't have to think too much about it. So there's a basic cover recreation and then there's something that's cankerized where that's almost simpler in a way because I'm I'm adding my character to these these covers that people have chosen uh, in terms of I honestly it's it's a struggle for me sometimes to come up with compositions it, it is difficult and I've been watching a lot of uh, YouTube videos on automatic drawing oh and I I've, Explain this. I, what is that? I'm, I'm completely unfamiliar. Automatic drawing is the idea of um, basically doing formless uh, stream of consciousness line making. Okay. You're, you're not creating a figure necessarily that can come out of it, but you're, the idea is not to create anything that exists in real life. And... Uh, you know, someone whose work I think is very much influenced by that, uh, even though he is creating forms, is Alex Nino. Mm -hmm. um, and so I will answer the other question there, which is uh, uh, people doing commissions that, that are inspirational. Uh, another person I've been seeing is Alex Nino. Uh, he's still working and he's doing drawings inside of his books that he sells on his Etsy site. And um, oh, his, his I'm stuff going is there great. When we're done. <laughs> yeah. It is. Yeah, I, I, I love Alex Nino, and it is very, you know, very much a just free flowing, uh, contoured um, landscape that could also include body parts, that could also include flora and rock formations, and so just trying to to break out of the idea of doing just strict anatomy. 
the opposite side of that, I've been watching David Finch uh, uh, anatomy tutorials on YouTube to get more into very strict formal how to draw folds and uh, you know different perspectives on a female's head and trying to just learn different aspects because I did not go to school and because I did not spend a lot of time learning from other artists, I feel like, okay, in my free time, I need to start doing more of that. Interesting. because So, but how long have you been doing that then? Uh, for the past three weeks. So not too long. So are you finding, because you have a natural sense of how you build characters, uh, and I love the way that you build characters. There's form, there's weight, there's, you know, balance. Like it's all there in my mind looking at your work. Uh, do you find that that would potentially get in the way? Uh, you know, thinking about, because David Finch draws very, you know, he draws super realistic. I mean, that's yeah. his whole approach. Yeah. Uh, do you find that that is an impediment? Or are you finding that it's helping you find those shapes sort of more naturally? It, it's helping simply because I'm looking for shortcuts at this point. And, and I, I, I had such a negative attitude about the idea of uh, formal rules when it comes to drawing. You yeah. know, get a Bern Hogarth book. And you'd sit there and like, this is where the elbow goes and this is how this goes and it, it's all true. I mean, you can't deny that that's how the human body works, but uh, I, it, there's something in me rejected that. I didn't wanna just copy Loomis or copy what Bern Hogarth was doing. Uh, and I, I, I feel like I missed out on some valuable tools there. Uh, so I'm just trying to, you know, give myself as much ammunition as I can when I sit down at the drawing board yeah. and say, okay, this is not going to be a struggle for me if I, you know, do a bird's eye view of this person at a three quarter view, whereas that would be very daunting to me two, three years ago. And it's just about learning that lesson. Oh, I, I saw this person do this. So I know it can be done. Uh, that, that's really more of what I'm looking for is, is some tricks. Are you are you working with perspective grids when you're? No. Oh, okay. Because no. I found that to be hugely helpful uh, when I started um, Vinegar Teeth, actually, because there had been a sort of a big break in between comics for me while I was chasing, you know, the Hollywood nonsense. Mm -hmm. And um, I shouldn't call it nonsense. That was nonsense. But um, and I started. I changed my whole approach to drawing. And so I would do all my pencils on tracing paper because okay. I started inking with a light pad. So I, you know, the idea of tracing paper being uh, much lighter and being able to see it easier through the light pad onto the paper for inking. But because of that, I created a bunch of perspective grids for myself and that just, it opened up everything for me in terms of really, really allowing me to lean into uh, um, you know, foreshortening and, and, and doing far more um, really dynamic layouts. Mm -hmm. No, I think that would be very valuable for me. I, I took drafting classes in high school. So I remember a lot of, you know, sitting there with protractors and, and measuring everything out. And it was very dull and technical. <laughs> so there was another thing that I rebelled against and thought, oh, I'm not going to do that. And I've seen people who, uh, do crazy, crazy perspective grids for what I deem to be fairly simple poses mm. and and uh, perspectives. But I do get that um, I am often drawing and redrawing something, trying to get it right without using the basic thing that you just said. It's like, well, if you create these forms and you work within that and you do that enough, then you won't need it all the time but it would definitely help you in the moments when you're stuck because yeah. you, you you really want to draw something a certain way but it's just not coming out if you had that in the back of your head you, you wouldn't be in this position so uh, valuable lesson to learn at, at age 47. 
<laughs> I, well, yeah, I mean, we're basically the same age. I'm a year older than yeah. you, but I mean, if you're really sort of interested and open to what creating can be in your life, I think that you're naturally curious and as a result want to continue to push yourself. I think that you and I are very similar in that way. Like I see what you're doing with your commissions and I know that you're working those things hard. Like mm -hmm. this isn't, these aren't just, oh, just eh, here's an idea, I'll whip it up and it's done. I mean, yeah. I, I know that's not what you're doing. Even, even beyond, um, or even actually including the cover recreations, you're still very purposeful in, in how you approach them and making it yours. I mean, that's mm. the intention of it. And so the idea of, of adding new layers and new tools to your toolbox is never a bad thing. No, no. And that's um, what I, what I find myself doing is at the end of the day, I will sit down and I start going through YouTube and I'm watching all these random videos that have nothing to do with, with art, you know, <laughs> even, even just now before we, you know, sat down here, I'm watching, you know, Tommy Aldridge, the drummer doing a demo at, at some drum clinic from 2013. And I'm, about seven minutes into this thing, I'm like, why am I watching this? I don't play the drum. I'm not learning anything from this. It's kind of cool to see Tommy Aldrich play this song, but you know, I just, um, again, it's that idea of like, I need to really focus on um, art, even when I'm not making art. Uh, well, I mean, I it's think it's good possible. because I'm as guilty as that too. Everyone I know is guilty of that. And I think you sort of need to, you know, tune out every once in a while and watch that. I mean, I watched ridiculous. I was watching Karen videos on Instagram before I came on. And sure. So, <laughs> well, I mean, you know? here's the thing, you know, that I spent uh, 25 years just watching movies and, and not drawing. So I feel like I've given myself enough couch time <laughs> watching <laughs> mindless entertainment I, I feel like uh i'm i'm due for for some late hours at the drawing table now uh it, just uh i wanted to jump in there for one second guys uh just a quick question for matt uh, -huh. uh in terms of troy mentioned you know how much you're putting into these pieces which piece was more difficult on you physically uh, the Secret Wars, Doctor Doom, or the Guts from Berserk piece? Which one had you in more traction? Um, I mean, you would think it would be the Secret Wars because of all the, the wires and stuff, but that's almost second nature to me now. I can really just, uh, it's almost meditation to do that type of detail. So the guts probably of the two, I would say, was um, was a little took more of a toll on me physically. <laughs> do you now? Yeah. And you don't have to answer this question, but when you do a subject matter uh, for a commission, and then you see another artist has done a similar subject matter for a commission, um, and yours blows it away. Is there is there a sense of like mm, yeah yeah <laughs> no because I know that I've got plenty of of <laughs> lesser drawings out there I just maybe <laughs> happened to hit a home run with this particular one but I've got five you know whiffs prior to that so uh, you know I I'm not real competitive in that way I know some people that are uh, and. Um, I've been trying very hard not to um, spend too much time looking at artists whose work I don't like. I, I've really, yeah. you know, made an effort to say that's not for me. I'm going to move on to the thing that is for me. And uh, it, it, that's not necessarily in relation to your, your question. Um, uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I, I do, get some satisfaction if I feel like I did a really good job on a piece and there's a yeah. similar one out there. And I, 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 I think anybody would be pleased to have that happen. So, but it's subjective, I, I, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, obviously uh, all, all art is, but there, there certainly is, um, 
I, and I think more, and I was, it was kind of, kind of being a bit of an ass asking that question, but, uh, and it wasn't trying to stick, it wasn't trying to push you into a corner or anything. Sure, answer. sure. But I think that it's, that there are different levels of approach with commissions. And yeah. obviously we don't know where that other artist is coming from um, in terms of where they are schedule wise and how oh, much yeah. they're getting, you know, how much they're getting paid for their piece. And so obviously there's still that sense of, of of a lot of commissions that just kind of feel like pinups a little bit and mm -hmm. you know maybe they're doing them for a smaller amount of money than they're just they work a few into their their schedule because they're just you know they're working on pages or whatnot um you know whereas it feels like with what what you're doing is you're you're putting as much importance on your commission work as you are your comic work and you're just scheduling them appropriately. Uh, is that fair to say? I think so. Yeah, I, I try to keep that in mind too when I when I see uh, uh, maybe a similar themed commission out there that you know someone might look at and think, oh, they didn't spend a lot of time. Well, maybe they didn't because maybe they only got paid to do an hour's worth of work on that mm -hmm. commission. So you're you're right. I think that the context really needs to be taken into account when you when you you know this this piece the that's on on the screen right now the collector uh you know paid us very well for that and i i hope that i put in the amount of effort and work that they were hoping for and and feel that they got their their value for the money that they graciously paid for that <laughs> so. i think so i mean i i mean looking at that piece i know that if i received that i would be over the moon so and i'm sure that cam can 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 uh uh speak to that because you probably would have spoken to, to the commissioner of this piece and i'm sure that they were over the moon oh uh, yeah absolutely i think uh cool. i think he'd already seen it before i shared it with him because i think we we shared on social media and yeah and, uh, my scan here on this piece isn't very good i don't know what image i'm pulling from right now but yeah, the even just like the monster's head, and I know Matt said earlier that he, he struggles with composition, but this felt um, very good on, on that level. So, um, that, uh, speaking of that too, guys, I just wanted to ask the question because um, social media and you guys are involved. You, you guys are you know, have your ears to the ground. You, you kind of know what's going on, and you'll see you have a lot of friends in the industry, a lot of artist friends, you know. A lot of guys, maybe you aren't, you don't know as well, but you know, you're, you're seeing their commissions or their pieces. How hard is it for you guys to um, not let um, certain requests or uh, themes to commissions, like another person's rendition seep in to what you're doing? And I, I don't see anything but you guys in your commissions i'm just curious how hard is it to fight that urge um to, to say for instance matt if if you saw a really cool guts piece or something you, you really enjoyed how hard is it to fight that urge to you know pull some influence from that piece into what you're doing or is it not an issue at all i'm uh, just something i'm kind of curious about for me it's not too difficult just because that was always a goal of mine to not uh, to not put out work that resembles other artists' work. Uh, so, you know, my tendency is to go in the opposite direction of what I see somebody doing. So there are some people that use a lot of techniques that I think are really great. And I think, man, I could use that and I, it would work very well. But I know that eagle-eyed collectors would notice that and think, oh, that's... <coughs> that technique is what artist X is using on their commissions or on their interior work. So, um, I, yeah. So, so to me, it's not too difficult to avoid that. Yeah. Same. I, I don't, I, I certainly like, I look at a lot of art, like I'm looking at art all day, uh, whether it be comic artists, painters, movies, reading books, whatever. I'm a mass consumer of media. Uh, but I think that 
my approach to things, and I've worked very purposefully to get to that point where I am very specific with what I do. And so I don't really find that anyone else's work uh, really filters in and it doesn't really resonate enough in me that I want to try and recreate what they've done or, or avoid it because I think I'm getting too close. And, um, and as, as a result of that, I can go and seek out stuff that just gets me excited about being sure. creative, knowing that I'm comfortable with that. I'm just going to go and do my own thing. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's, yeah, sorry guys, I interrupted you there, Matt. It was, just, it was good to know because I, yeah, obviously you guys are very incredibly unique at, at what you do. I was just, just curious with that mindset, you know, um, because I know talking to Gerardo Zafino about writing, his biggest thing is he struggles to not write in cliches. Mm -hmm. And I know Tro Troy bugs him to write all the time. All the time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but uh, that's just something he, he often says. So I was just curious about the artist mindset. And I just wanted to point out too, you guys, you know, screen tones are a big thing going on right now. And, and lots of artists use them. And lots of guys in our group use them as well. Not to shit on uh, screen tones by any means. But it, it's interesting you mentioned that, Matt, because this looks, the sword that Guts is using, looks like you use screen tones on it, just like the planet on the Watcher piece as well. You could have very well just used screen tones in both cases and you chose not to, which was uh, very that interesting. That is actually a screen tone on the the Guts piece. Oh, is it? it? Looks, yeah, it looks like it's hand-drawn. Uh, it was a, um, I think the brand name is called Deleter. Yep, it's, oh, cool. it's a, a Japanese tone. It's the only commission that I've used it on, uh, oh, that, and and I felt like because it's manga, that is a standard tool that's used. So I felt that it was appropriate to use it in this piece. Uh, otherwise, I, I would have just done stippling on that. Well, that's that's interesting. I'll I'll pull up the I, and the only reason I bring that up is because the watcher piece, the texture on the planet, mm -hmm. um, was very much similar uh, from a distance if uh, i actually can hold the original right now but i'll bring that up in a second no i was, I was just kind of curious i and that you had me fooled with the guts piece because i had the original in hand and i did not realize that that was yeah. a screen phone, so yeah it's interesting it, it's it's sort of it's become popular again back when i started doing comics it was uh a lot of people were using it i i used it on some Bill the Clown stuff. I used it here and there. And, and it's super fussy to use. And yeah. little pieces, it just gets everywhere. It gets under your fingernails. And and uh, so I just, I gave it up and just started doing everything with a brush. And now I don't even know where I'd put it in my <laughs> pieces. It would, sure. there's not room. <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I mean, I, 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 I just try to create the tone with the pen. Yeah, no, I'm I, I I'm the same way in in terms of the difficulty of using it, sitting there with the Exacto blade and cutting it out. I I got into it because I had read an interview with Dan Klaus talking about Zipatone way back in the '90s, and he used it to such great effect that I went and bought some. And actually, I had two or three sheets left. And I gave them to Michelle Fife because I know he collects that stuff and you know still uses it. But what I did before I gave it away was I scanned it. So I have a file with that Zipatone in it. And so when I do black and white work, I can just grab that file and select the black and then drop that tone in. Uh, it doesn't work when you resize it. You have to, to bitmap it. Yeah, size it, bitmap it, and then because otherwise it gets too fuzzy. But uh, I, I, I do use it, but in a technically a digital form. Well, and I think that like that's what Ed is using with the Dua Shade on his new project is that he did a bunch of full sheets mm -hmm. and scanned them. Yeah, I, I, I could be wrong, but I, I think this is what he said, and that he is dropping those those tones in digitally because he does he doesn't have the Dua Shade board. Yep. Yep. Um, I don't even know if they still make it. I used it on a project years and years and years ago. And it's quite horrible stuff to use. It smells bad and the papers, yeah. you know, it's not great. So 
Yeah, I mean, you know, adding that sort of digital element to the comic stuff, you know, experimenting with the comic stuff is kind of fun. And then, you know, going back to the more traditional approach for commissions is a, kind of a nice balance. Mm -hmm. And yeah, this, the, the other piece in question where this felt like um, this planet specifically, um, this is hand drawn. I thought you could have used a screen tone there, but, and then when I first saw it, I thought it was, but um, it's not, so. <laughs> Yeah, that one was a tough one. I, I, uh, I, I, based on the request for that one, I put in more <laughs> detail than I probably should have. Uh, it was but it uh, just kind of got away from me. <laughs> so it was it was a single figure uh, with no background. Exactly. And, <laughs> and this is what what Matt did. Because <laughs> I thought, well, I was like, well, the planets are in the foreground, so <laughs> that's technically not a background, and I'm just going to put some black in the back, but I'll put some Kirby crackle in there, and then it turned into what it turned into. So, And then, some, and then another planet and some black stars. and yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It's amazing, by the way, though. And it, it, what's interesting is, is you know, have – are you sort of experimenting a little bit with the commissions and, and it has it then worked its way into your new canker stuff that you're working on? It's, it's making me uh, really want to simplify things with canker partly to take a break from doing this highly detailed work and partly to get the new canker stuff done quicker. So I am really looking to use a minimal line on the current, story that I'm doing, uh, some parts of it, I just can't help, but to, you know, like I was, I was just drawing, uh, penciling a, a vehicle that one of the characters was going to get out of. And at first it was very simple and streamlined, but then the more I thought about it, it was like, no, this is not what this character would drive. This is going to be made of flesh and bone and that warts and pimples on it. And, and so that's most likely where that will go. But uh, and I'm also telling myself to really simplify my color choices and use a lot of flat colors with some highly detailed stuff thrown in here and there. Uh, but we'll see how that turns out because I may just start fiddling and, and keep going with it. So. so speaking to that where you're trying to sort of streamline the process of Kankor to speed up the process, uh, you know, to, to, to what end, uh, you know, is that for you? Is it just about wanting to get more work out or is it about challenging your yourself creatively and seeing if you can sort of strip away some of the unnecessary aspects of what you've done before or do you, like making it its own thing? It's, it's a little of each and, and really wanting to focus on storytelling so that I'm not thinking to myself, well, you know, I should really stick to a, a splash page here because I want to put all this detail in it, you know, looking at it from a different perspective where I'm saying, no, I, I want to, you know, do a nine panel grid on this page or, you know, do some weird layouts with the, the panel composition. Um, and maybe it doesn't need this much detail. Maybe I can have really stark areas of, of no background at all. And the, in the Kankor book um, the, that came out last month from Ad House, uh, towards the end, I was adding some new pages and I did a 16 panel page and just penciled it and inked it as quickly as I could, colored it as quickly as I could. And it's my favorite page in the book. Uh, nice. It's just a fight, a real simple fight scene. Uh, each each panel was colored in a different way, some with flat colors, some with some shading. And and I really like the way that page turned out. So that's been inspired me to do more things like that in this new one. Um, and uh, that we'll, we'll see how it turns out. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some pages that take me weeks and weeks to finish. <laughs> but, uh, well, and, and that's a good a good time to jump into Kankor because... Uh, you know, we had wanted to talk to you about it a while back, but because of what happened to the world, uh, mm -hmm. it was really delayed, uh, you know, both from the printer and then through once it got to North America, 
uh, just getting into comic shops, but it's out now. Yeah. Uh, and it's been out for a couple months now. No, almost. A, well, yeah, a little over a month. What is today? The 29th. So it came out on June 17th. Oh, geez, my. Oh, I, that's because Cam got copies a little bit earlier, I think. That's, that's right. That's right. Been. So I'm not that bad at it. <laughs> not that calendar challenged. But, um, you know, how are how's the reception been now? Like, are you really happy with how it came out? And I'm not necessarily talking about reviews. You read reviews, you don't read reviews. But just sort of the overall sense of your peers and people that you know that have, that have the book in hand. Uh, the reception has been beyond what I had hoped for. You know, you always get nervous about what people will think. And uh, silence is the worst possible thing. Or, you know, you get like, <laughs> yeah. I, I did get, uh, um, I won't say who said this, but there's a close friend said, uh, the printing looked, camera. <laughs> said the printing looked really nice. So, um, what that, the hell kind uh, of back ass, backhand compliment is that? <laughs> to be fair, they hadn't read it fully. They had just picked no. it up from the store that day, so that was really all they could say about it. Plus, oh. they had already read it in, in you know single issues. Uh, fair so I, I, I'll give, I'll cut them some slack there. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 been uh, very humbling, and and it, you know. It, it makes me feel like I'm on a good path uh, because the uh, the reception that I've been getting has been very positive so far. And the book is sold, according to Chris uh, Pitzer at Ad House, the book is selling very well. Well, so, and as it should. And, I mean, it's a beautiful book. I mean, I think my only wish for the book had, was that it had been larger. Um, I, that's been one, yeah, I, that is one thing I've heard from other people as well, yep. Yeah. And it, and it's just it just speaks to the depth and the quality of of your work that you just want to immerse yourself in it more than than what the smaller package um, can offer. But it's still a brilliant book. Like I I love it. I was going Thank through you. it again today, and and just sort of trying to come up with some things that I wanted to talk to you about, and. It reminded me of the interview that you and Chris had, and the interviewers who I, I believe you're you're good friends with one of the interviewers. I, uh, I can't remember his name. Oh, was that really? Remember. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was that yeah, one. Vince, yeah, yeah, Vince. And so you know, he talked about genre and and you know where do you place a book like this? And I think that I can only speak about the North American mentality about genre, about uh, people always want to ca wanting to categorize something, you know, is it this, is it this, you know, is it horror, is it autobiography, is it superhero? Mm -hmm. And when in fact it's all of them and sort of none of them. And, and it, it's, it was, it was, was it Jay that said it feels like a very personal book and it does. And was your intention to because it does subvert genre mm -hmm. in the sense that you can't just label it oh you should read this great horror book or you should read this um because it's it you can't just pin it to one was your intention to really push genre or did or is it just what you wanted to do and it just that's how it came out I, I think that it helped me create the book just not to limit myself in terms of what it was. Uh, adding the autobi autobiographical elements allowed me to um, put some stuff in there that had been stuck in the back of my mind for years and years and years. Like I, I need to get these stories out. And there was a lot of a lot of stories that I, I took out of the book that were much more personal and much more insightful into my mental state and emotional problems. And, um, you know, there's, there's elements that I deliberately left out of the book because I felt like it would take it too far in one direction. Anytime I thought that I was going too deep into a certain genre, I would pump the brakes and go in a different direction just so that it wouldn't be just one thing. 
And uh, so in that sense, you know, that was a very deliberate thing, but there wasn't a master plan as far as, you know, pages one through three are going to be this and pages seven through eight are going to, you know, th that, that part of it wasn't uh, uh, mapped out, uh, so to speak. Well, and, and, and that probably has a lot to do with you self-publishing the book and sure. sort of really not feeling beholden to a publisher's, um, you know, because let's be real, most publishers do sort of have a, what's the best way to put it, um, you know, they got a vibe, you know, like each publisher yeah. has its own thing. And putting out your own book, like you said, anything goes, it could be whatever you wanted it to be. Well, and there's safety in, in that identification. So if a publisher is known for doing a certain type of work, mm -hmm. you stick with that because it's scary to, to put out something that's a little bit different. And that's the beauty of what Ad House does is they, they cover so many different genres yeah. that a book like that, I, I think, you know, Chris was um, totally on board with, with having it be in his library. So I, you know, I, um, I do say, you know, the, the, the book takes place in a comic book. That's the setting. It's, it takes place in a comic book. And if I was to pick a genre, a true genre for the book, because I think right now in the back it says um, like sci-fi, horror, superhero, I yes. would just say as genre comic book. Uh, you know, because I, I just I put everything that I like about comic books into that book. Well, and and it obviously because you're uh, an artist who's influenced by a lot of different things, including music. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're a big music guy, uh, and I always I think we talked about this last time that you can really tell the artists who are really heavily influenced by music. You can you can feel it in their work, sure. And so why not? And I think that there's a frustration at least I have with, with North American comics and, and people that consume comics where there is an expectation of what comics should be. And when you push back against that expectation, um, some people love it. Uh, and I think that those are people who probably also consume a lot of other media because yeah. uh, they, they seem to be more forgiving, you know, with music and TV and movies than they do comics. A lot of people think comics can only be one sort of simple way. Mm -hmm. And when you push against that, you know, the, the intelligent comic readers lap it up. Sure. And so knowing that going in and, and creating a book like Kankor, where you can just do whatever you're feeling, like if it's, if it's sort of a, um, an emotional, you know, visual metaphor or whatever you're doing like your auto autobiographical biography elements are then building towards then when you go into these stories of these faceless characters you know in space and doing the things that they do um like what 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 is that like when you first started working that out like did it did it did it feel right immediately or was it was like eh, do i need to pull that in again or, or were you not really paying attention to what was going on? I think, you know, I had the safety, uh, as you say, of self-publishing. So I didn't have to worry too much about the Wednesday crowd, picking it up off the shelf, flipping through it and deciding whether or not they were going to get that or the new Justice League book, you know, that, mm. that didn't play into it. I, I didn't have a competition with, everything else that was on the shelf, because in my mind, I'm printing it, I'm sending it directly to people who are emailing me or contacting me through my website to, to buy the book. So it, it was much more of a mainline thing to a very specific audience. Yeah. So that is a, a great position to be in because you can do the things that are going to please yourself as a creator and as a reader. You want to make the book that you yourself want to read. And if you say, I'm not going to worry about selling 10,000 copies because I know it's not going to, but if I have 500 readers that are all 
digging what this is. I, I, I feel good about whatever choice that I make uh, mm -hmm. for the most part. There are still things that are scary. And in fact, this image that's on the screen right now, I was, I really had to question whether or not I was gonna put that in the book uh, because it's a problematic image uh, for me. <laughs> it's, it's a, it, it comes from a, a place of um, frustration and uh, judgment and being um, a young kid who uh, had very strong opinions about art, even though I wasn't really making art at the time. Uh, when Rob Liefeld swiped or paid homage to Ronin in Swipe. X Force number one, <laughs> uh, it it let's call I, it what it is. Yeah, I mean, I was furious. It it made me so angry, and so when I when I came up with with doing this page, uh, I thought, well you know, especially putting the after life film. Um, yeah. Well, and, and that's the joke for anyone that doesn't, I mean, sure. Everyone here knows it. I mean, I don't need to go over it. Everyone knows it. Uh, I mean, when I saw that, I fucking died laughing. It's hilarious. <laughs> well, and I asked Jim Rugg because, you know, Jim Rugg is somebody who's very meta, very uh, tuned into comics history and, he, I, I knew would get the implications of that. And I said, I, you know, I asked him a favor. I said, can you look at this and tell me if you think it's a good idea or not? And he, he's like, you know, it's a good idea. Just do it. <laughs> Why are you even asking? Just put it in there. <laughs> um, and, yeah. and, and why can't we, right? I mean, <clears throat> why? And this is what frustrates me and not what you're saying. What you're saying is, is is spot on that <clears throat> there is this expectation that and th finally we're getting rid of that expectation of what comics should be yeah but we're we're creative uh people just as as much as anybody in any other uh um, medium and so why can't we include these these strong emotional things that we're feeling in our work right it's it's you know why should we tiptoe and go oh, we don't want to upset that person or whatever it's like screw it you know like i felt very strongly about this when i saw it there there wasn't a nod to the original image at least i don't think there was i can't remember i blanked his whole career out of my head um and so why can't you call him on it you know it's it's well, i mean it was honestly it wasn't so much calling him on it as, as it was me letting go of it because this character that's standing behind Kankor in that section of the book <clears throat> is trying to get him to join his team. He, he sees him out breaking rocks and he's like, you'd be perfect on my team. And Kankor refuses and ends up mm -hmm. killing the guy. And, and that to me is my artistic life in a nutshell, because I had multiple opportunities to collaborate with people on things. I had friends in, in high school and in college who were putting together zines and wanting to do uh, superhero books or anything that I thought was beneath me or distasteful. And I was like, I don't know, I don't want to be part of that. Um, and I, I, I shot myself in the foot for not taking part in those things and, and, joining up with other artists and, and maybe swiping here and there just to learn, uh, you know, I, and so now I'm at a point where I can't blame Rob Liefeld for doing that. I think that he, um, you, you will probably disagree with me on this, Troy, but I, I do truly believe that he has a real passion for comics, maybe not good comics, but <laughs> He has a passion that is very strong and was definitely stronger than my passion for comics at the time because I was not making comics and he was. That's that's really where this page was coming from was just this sense of like, look, if you had eased up a little bit back then, you probably wouldn't have uh, had so many years of bitterness and and frustration. I think that's pretty common though, the, the bitterness. I think that uh, as where and I'm you know speaking to a lot of other creators and especially for myself because I had that as well as we're trying to find our feet 
and it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a, de a developmental thing. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a phase in us when we're starting to lean towards where we're going to go. We just don't know it yet. Sure. And we resent everyone <laughs> that is more successful than us. And some people who draw better, some who don't, but especially the people who we feel don't or don't draw better than what we're going to be. And it's just us really struggling to find our voice. Mm -hmm. Even though we're headed in that direction, we just don't know it yet. And so you get that chip on your shoulder and maybe it's six, seven, eight years in or wherever, whenever it happens, because you're kind of muddling along at that point. You're just creating crap, 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 crap. And then as you start to get better and start to figure it out, you, then that's where the judging really starts to happen. Sure, yeah. with a lot of creatives where it's like, well, I understand this. Why didn't that artist understand that? Look at their work. Why are they so famous? Their work is terrible, you know, and on and on and on. And really it's just us moving towards what we need to where we need to go. You're at a point in your career now where, and I'm not going to use the word comfortable because that's a terrible thing to say to a creative person, but you know, what you're about for the most part at least you you know how to create an idea at a very high level mm -hmm. you know whether it be in an Im in one image in a commission or you know on pages with the canker and so that starts to drop away when you start sure. to really start to understand how you can present your ideas in story form and find success with that where you're not struggling just to get a page done and you're like, Oh, I, I guess it's okay. Oh shit. I got to do another one now, yeah. you know, where you can think of it as a whole, then that other stuff just starts to fall away. I mean, yeah, you can still look at some people. I, I don't get the, the sort of love that Rob still gets. I don't understand it. There's artists who I'm friends with who love them and I, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. It doesn't affect me in any way. It's not like I'm, you know, making voodoo dolls out of Rob Liefeld. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, as someone who still has a strong affection for Kiss, uh, you know, I can't judge anyone too harshly who's got <laughs> a deep connection to something that they really enjoyed when they were thirteen. You know, I, I, and I think that's the key. I think what you're seeing is is guys our age who are you know, they hold that stuff with some nostalgia. We just happen to be older and had a different perspective than his audience did. I, I think, you know, that, that four or five year gap between us and the 13 year old that was coming in and buying X Force True. One is yeah. pretty crucial. Yeah. I, you know, you're, you're spot on with that. Cause you're know, thinking about, sort of the love that's given to him, it is those guys that are sort of five, six, seven years younger than us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And yeah. you know, and you don't want to take anything away from them. I just don't get it. <laughs> but you yeah. know, then again, we were reading stuff where we were seeing like Brian Boland books, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Like you were seeing the quality of work that could be done in comics so you're just like, well, why, why aren't you doing yeah, more like why, this? <laughs> why, why was he a millionaire and Paul Chadwick wasn't? That's, yeah. That was my rationale then. It just didn't make sense to me back then. Now it makes sense. Like, I, I get it. And so as you move forward now with, you know, new Cancor material, which is exciting to hear, um, I mean, you weren't really – hiding that you were just like hey working on new Kencore stuff which is which is great um what what shape is that going to take are you are you going to go back to self-publishing are you just going to put out a big book and work with chris again or you know are you are you going to put it out digitally first or well the plan right now uh and my wife and i were talking about this today i think that i want to do a um a soft rollout of new content, meaning uh, digital first. And this is how I started. When I first was doing my uh, old, old blog 
back in you know 2011 2012 i was putting up a page a week of uh my, you know, my first Kankor comic and so the thought is to do something like that on patreon and the difficult thing is that because of the way that I work, I'm not always working chronologically in the story. So I can't necessarily offer Patreon subscribers a, a very distinct, uh, you know, standard narrative mm -hmm. because the page that you're looking at that I'm posting on Friday might not, you know, once the book is printed might not be where it is in the story. Now, I, you know, I may find a way to, to reconfigure the, the narrative as I go. So, you know, as long as I'm upfront with people about that and say, look, you know, you're getting pieces of this story or you're seeing it uh, as it's progressing in terms of the creation of it. Uh, you know, I, I hope that people will be okay with that and, and be satisfied with seeing, um, you know, something just develop. And I'm sure there are plenty of people that are like, no, I don't want to see any of it until it's finished. But the idea is to get uh, no less than 28 pages done and then have that physically printed, self-published again, mm -hmm. uh, just to get the stuff out there and then have original pages that Cam can put up on the site and, and have those available so that, um, you know, I have more physical pieces out there uh, so to offer to people and to take to conventions if and when conventions start happening again. And uh, so, you know, that's, that's really what I'm looking at now. The, the tiers that I'm thinking about for my Patreon would be past, present, future. So past is taking all of my previous Kankor stuff that I, that's not in the ad house book and putting it up for Patreon subscribers. And then the present would be my daily warm up drawings and um, anything non Kankor related. And then the future part will be this in progress Kankor story that we'll eventually see print. So that is what I'm planning on launching maybe end of next week and see how that goes. Cool, I mean, it's, it's awesome. And you're seeing a lot of creators that are direct marketing essentially is you know you're doing sure. talking about to their audience and between you me and the apple tree and everybody that's watching that i think that that's a very viable uh new way of doing comics and i mean i'm i'm not considering it myself i am doing it myself mm -hmm. where i'm not worried about a publisher right now and thankfully with the commissions i don't have to be and yeah. so i schedule you know, time in my in my week to work on comics. I'm working smaller. You know, it's funny because I was like, "Oh, I'm going to strip everything away too and do something simpler." No, I'm not. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell, I'm thinking. But uh -huh. I'm working smaller, so it won't take as long. But the same idea, you know, talking to Ed at Piscor, and and he's doing that with Red Room, where he's putting out new pages every week, and he just charges. I think it's three bucks a month and he's not hiding the fact that he will eventually make hard copies of this book down the road when he's done. And why not? Why not allow people to be involved in the process if they want to be sure. and, and get a new page or two pages a week or whatever it ends up being, you know, for you or, or for me and, and, but seeing the process of it as well and, and just direct to fans and, and, and offering them the opportunity to see this stuff before everybody else. And it's great. You know, you, you don't have to worry about having to compete with 17 copies of the same issue of X-Men on the shelf, you know? Yeah. And I, you know, I, I had a conversation with some other artists a, a few weeks ago. Actually, it was, it was group text that I was eyeballing as I was drawing. I wasn't really involved until the very end. I, I threw out some thoughts about what they were saying, but essentially they were talking about the difficulties that they had getting projects greenlit by publishers and, and uh, a certain publisher was having some difficulties and they were cutting titles. And, and you know, one of my friends said that they had multiple ideas that they'd like to see out there. And in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, we'll just do them. Like, why are you waiting for a publisher? Why is that yeah. even 
because I've been doing this now since 2012. And at no point until I started talking to Chris Pitzer, did I ever concern myself with that. It was always just like, I'm going to do this. And even if I just print one copy for myself, that's enough, you know, and at the time I had a day job. Yeah. My day job was doing commissions. So if I still have a day job, but you know, the, the desire to keep making this comic is still there. And I, I, I'm, it's not even a thought right now. Oh, I've got to go talk to image or I've got to go talk to IDW or whomever it is. It, it's just make the book, just make yeah. it. Yeah. You know. Well, and there's all these different avenues now to get your books out there that you don't have to, because you know, more and more publishers are sort of moving away from giving any kind of, well, page rates are almost non-existent now at, mm. at most companies, or if they are page rates, they're nominal. Yeah. And so this idea of getting a small advance against potential back end, you know, like I said, but then once again, you put out, maybe do a year or two's worth of work and get a book done. And, you know, you're doing whatever you have to, to, you know, keep the lights on and, and, you know, food on the table. And then once again, you're competing with a phone book worth oh, of sure. materials and diamond and yeah. like retailers have to do what they have to do to keep their lights on, to keep bread in the oven. So they, they're, you know, they're going to order what they know they're going to sell and, you know, maybe they have a little bit in their budget left over that you've created something enough that piques their interest that they're willing to bring in a couple of copies. Mm-hmm. Or and maybe they don't. Yeah. And so why not just do it, what a lot of people are doing now? You look at these hugely successful Kickstarters. So you're talking about Jim Rugg earlier. I mean, he had a huge, a huge hit. Um, with his new book, with his Kickstarter, and yeah, and Ryan, Ryan Brown. Brown, yeah, and um, oh, um, what's her name? I'm blanking on her name. The, oh, she's a writer, uh, Alex, Alex DeCampi. Okay. Um, I think that's how you pronounce her name. Uh, she did a Kickstarter, and they did really well too. And this idea of direct marketing to fans, if you come through, if you build a model that works, and if you say, if you come along with me on this journey, I can promise you something at the end. Yeah. And yeah. if you're reliable, they'll, they'll, and they like your work, then they're going to come, they're going to enjoy that. They're going to come along with you. Absolutely. And, and I've had people reach out to me knowing that the book was in stores, knowing that Amazon has it, knowing that you could order it directly from ad house. And people have said, I want to get it from you. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, well, a variety of things, you know, one that they're getting it directly from the artist, but also, you know, that it's, it's more beneficial for me. And in some ways it is, in other ways it's not because, you know, I, after years of self-publishing, um, the fulfillment side of it is no longer, um, well, it never really was enjoyable for me. Uh, it's especially not enjoyable for me just because I, I, uh, I, I have spent so much time doing it. And because I worked in printing and I worked uh, doing mailing fulfillment, um, I always wanted to keep my art separate from all that. So that is the one downside of it for me to do a Kickstarter, like looking at Ryan Brown's and I see, oh, wow, he had 1,600 people back him. In my mind, I'm thinking that 1,600 pieces of mail that you have to process. <laughs> 1600 potential uh you know i sent out 50 books and about half of them got hung up in the mail uh because i you know that mailed them right after covid happened and it was a nightmare it stressed me out so much because as the days went by i got more and more dms from people and emails hey i ordered this book from you three weeks ago and do you have a tracking number and I was starting to have flashbacks. So, you know, that, that aspect of it, I think I would want to partner with somebody who would handle the distribution and the fulfillment side of it. Yeah. Well, and there are people that do that. There are people that, that you can hire to run your Kickstarter campaign and, um, you know, offhand, I don't know names, but there are people that, that can do that for you. And, 
you know, if you're honest about what you need in terms of taking the time to do the book, but also um, I, I just love Kickstarter the campaigns that are like, look, we're just going to do the book. We're going to print it. You can order a copy or not order a copy. I think, you know, I wouldn't really worry about all those. If we hit to this, then you get buttons. If you hit this, you know, that stuff just seems exhausting to me. Um, oh, yeah. It's, it's just like, here's a cool book. Get a copy, you know, and you yeah. sort of have thresholds of, of uh, um, how much they're going to cost per volume, you know, by volume. So, yeah, Ryan and Charles, were they had a, a goal where um, – Charles was going to write and record an album of songs based on curse words, and then they were going to have it pressed on vinyl. And I'm like, they must have, they, they have to like really love doing that. Type yeah, of thing. yeah. That just seems like a nightmare to me. But if that's, you know, I, I, more power to them. I, I, you know, I certainly want more Kankor product out there, and I've been yeah. very lax. And getting, you know, I, I've been talking, I had talked to a toy manufacturer last year and I haven't followed up on that as I should have. But, um, uh, you know, there, there's definitely um, um, more that I could be doing in, in terms of getting kink or product. But uh, right now, the, the book, I think, is the most important thing to be doing. It, it is, you know, and, and I'm sure, like, me because we we are so exacting in in what we're what we do that it takes time and mm -hmm. we only got so much of that and mm -hmm. so finding that balance between commission and comics like right now i'm only giving comics one day a week i want to yeah. uh you know get commissions and and i feel i feel pretty great that people have given me the money they've given me you know for a piece of artwork that doesn't even exist, you know, sure. that they're, that they have that expectation of seeing what I've done and knowing what I put into them. But that's still, you know, there's a lot of faith they're putting in there. And I, I really appreciate that and respect that. And so comics is getting one day a week now. And, and um, <laughs> I mean, I kind of keep really handcuffing myself a bit with <laughs> the work that I'm doing on them as I keep pushing them more and more, but I'm loving it. So I don't want to, regress from that i don't want to pull back yeah. from that. i want to see where i can go with it you know and yeah. and so yeah it's uh it's it's been fun in that regard and and clearly looking at your commissions you're seeing that you're having a lot of fun as well and so does that loosen things up with you with canker because i mean obviously you have money coming in from commissions you're calling it a day job now and and so has that informed canker in a way that you really can just cut loose because perhaps the financial end of it just is not a concern at all, or maybe it was just never a concern to begin with. I think the combination of, uh, you know, knowing that I've got um, some semi reliable income uh, outside of making the book. I mean, and the book was never a major source of income anyway. The art uh, always was, the original pages were. And, you know, I was fortunate working at a, a print shop. My overhead on printing my books for years was incredibly small. So my profit margin on the actual books was was very high. So I made a decent amount, but my volume weren't super high. Um, so the, the freedom, I think, is really coming from uh, the fact that the world is upside down right now. And things that made zero sense four months ago make total sense now and vice versa. There are things that I thought about the world that have been completely upended. And in terms of how that affects my art, uh, I, I, I feel uh, much freer in terms of the kind of content that I want to make. I, I yeah. feel like there are no rules. There are no boundaries to what I'm making. It doesn't matter. And I am definitely not trying to speak to uh, a wider audience. Um, I, you know, I'm not looking to get a Netflix show. No, no offense to anybody whose goal is to have a Netflix show based on their work. You know, I heard Stan Sakai, they're doing a Usagi show. Yeah. It's all, you know, the, oh my gosh, that's so great. 
And I'm thinking, man, this guy's been making comics for 40 years. They've been putting out these beautiful collections. Uh, you know, like he's won Eisner's. Thousands and, so and thousands of pages of, of yeah, amazing that, comics. That's the achievement. But the Netflix thing, people are losing their minds over. And I'm like, that's not the goal. You know? I, know, and I, I kind of I kind of get it. It's frustrating. I have I share your frustration, but I kind of understand it. Sure. And it's because we all consume it. Not yeah. everyone consumes comics. Yeah. Everyone consumes TV and movies. And from the earliest ages, I mean, it was the easiest way to entertain a child is, you know, you pop in a Disney movie, even if they didn't understand the story, they understood the emotional beats yeah. that were happening, right? Like, oh, happy, sad, oh, action, oh, scary, you know, that kind of thing. And it is that there still is this perception that the end goal is for someone else to take our creation and make it their own thing. And we get a check. No one knows how little or how big. Yeah. Um, you know, that's always a side benefit. Like if that happens, wonderful. But yeah, I mean, for it to be the objective is always you're always going to lose, you know, in, in, in that in, cause you're guessing at what some person in an office is looking for. Yeah. And I, I, my, my thing as a creator is I don't want to be a footnote to my own creation. If there was a Wikipedia page about Kank or if it had ever become a TV show or a movie, uh, I wouldn't want there to be a little reference thing of based on the comic by Matt Allison. You know, I, I would want yeah. my creation to be, that and then the footnote be whatever the and that's all negotiation with the yeah and i and i've stuff. been through development on a ton of things and i'm still doing stuff because i love movies i think everyone knows that i've directed one i love movies but you know i always sort of considered them to be two things and especially with this new comic thing that i'm working on it is so weird it is mm -hmm. so weird and i'm really excited about that and you know, you try not to read reviews of stuff that comes out, but you do. <laughs> and re reading some reviews of Trout where clearly they didn't understand what I was trying to do with it. Yeah. And and having their very ignorant opinion on what I should have done instead. And I was just like, I'm not making for comics for those people at all or trying to at all anymore. And with this new thing that I'm doing, forget about it like they will have no idea what the hell i'm trying to do with this thing yeah no that's good i i, I appreciate that because i i feel like you know it's um uh, you know there you there's so many avenues that you can take there's so many audiences that that you can try to appeal to and and there's no harm in, in trying to appeal to a broad audience it's just not fun for me to 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 make product that really does that um that's just my personal yeah well and just reading rich's comment here about more comic book adaptations only being good for both comic artists and animators there isn't really anything that shows that to be true i mean animators work on whatever they're you know working on at the studio whether it be an original idea or a comic adaptation and there really hasn't been, you know, in the grand scheme of things, proven that an adaptation of a comic benefits the sales of a comic. You know, sure. it hasn't played out really with live action either. You know, maybe you get a little bit more or a little bump in sales, but it's not like a comic creator has become incredibly wealthy based off of, you know, an adaptation of their work. Yeah, the only the only way it would seem that you're going to do that is if um, you sign a, a development deal for all of your work, and that's yeah. true. The author, well, yeah, and that's like King, happened King, a couple of times. Now. You know, Stephen King and and Clive Cussler and all those people. Yeah. It's like every book gets optioned, and and that is just a steady income stream for them. And at that point, they don't even care what the result is of the adaptation. It's just like well, that's another way for me to make money. And that's fine. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But that shouldn't, like you're saying, that shouldn't be the goal. Like that shouldn't be um, it's your more, shining moment. 
It's more that it's seen, I think, a lot of times as a consolation prize for putting in so much work into comics that there, you know, I, I did see um, uh, I, I hate naming names because I don't want it to sound like I'm ever shitting on somebody. I honestly am not, but uh, they had made the announcement about the new Thor movie and how Jane Foster was going to be Thor. And or, wait, no, no, I'll take that back. Scratch that. <laughs> this is about New Mutants and, and Bill Sienkiewicz. Okay. <laughs> um, Bill Sienkiewicz posted a, a video from the New Mutants movie featuring the character Magic fighting a dragon. And a lot of the imagery looked like it was taken directly from his pages from the New Mutants book. And uh, someone in the comments on his Twitter feed said, Wow, it's you know it's great to see your your vision kind of uh, finally come to fruition. And I'm thinking when oh. he when he drew that page, that was the fruition. This is not. You know like, what the you know that that takes us back to the Rob Liefeld moment. Sure, <laughs> it's yeah. just moving now. <laughs> yeah, that's just it. And you know, I understand why the person said that. And I don't want to slam them or Bill Sienkiewicz for you know liking that person's comment or anything like that. I get it. Um, you know, but be, to be such a, a unique voice like Sienkiewicz, mm -hmm. uh, that can never be replicated by CGI or an actor in a costume. No. Uh, you know, that to me is just like you're missing the point of why his art resonates so much to me, at least. So, yeah, I mean, it's 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 how he does everything. I mean, mm -hmm. his his line, you know, his his use of color and blacks. And I mean, he is another guy that just so is uniquely his own thing. And I can't help but think that any sort of live action representation of that would fall dramatically short of the image that he put yeah. on paper yeah. because he is so uniquely special in the way that he creates images. And I love movies, but you know, there's sort of his only sort of one way to capture images and, and you're trying to make stuff look real. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to engage your audience and make them believe that it's real. Yeah. And so there's only sort of so many ways you can do that. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's interesting to sort of see how it is progressing in that way. And, and, um, you know, and I think it's very easy uh, to tell when a creator is trying to create an IP versus telling a story that they just really want to tell. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I, you know, I, I spoke with two animators a few years ago, and we may have talked about this last time we we did this uh, live stream. Where uh, one guy was working for Disney, another guy was trying to put together some ideas for uh, Ridley Scott for um, some YouTube uh, CGI animation stuff. And both of these uh, gentlemen thought that Kankor might be a good fit. Um, so they were looking at some of my older stuff. And I had a bunch of characters that I had originally uh, had as, as part of Kankor's team. And I don't have any real personal co connection to those characters. So I was really pushing, like, could we not focus on Kankor and maybe do something with these other characters? Because I would gladly give those over to somebody else. Like, if you want to take yeah. my Obrax, he's a guy with axes for hands. I don't, you know, that was just a thing I drew. <laughs> and personally, I love that. I love that. I love that. Stat sheet. Uh -huh. Powers, aliases, marital status is divorced. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Everything about Cobrax I love. <laughs> well, how does he hug his wife? <laughs> he does have interchangeable hands. He can put on oh, hands to do a story where you see those. And um, Cobrex may return to the pages of Kankor. Yeah, he could. He could return. <laughs> so before we kind of because we, we like to sort of stick to an hour and a half for these, and mm -hmm. um, so before to wrap up, a um, couple more things. Do you do you sort of have a 
an overall direction with the new Cancor stuff. Like you have sort of a couple of places you want to take them and not necessarily do you have the ending figured out, but like, do you have sort of a path in mind or, or is it just coming to you as it comes to you? You know, I, I, I certainly don't have an ending in mind, but I do have a, a general idea of, uh, how things are going to launch with this current story. And uh, it's, I'm really leaning into my, um, uh, my love of, of Jim Woodring here and looking at his man hog and Frank stories as inspiration in particular man hog. Um, Cause I just, I'm very personally connected to that character. So I, I, if, if, if I am going to, basically swipe an idea from somebody. It's going to be from Jim Woodring and from that. Yeah. Uh, I did post this on Instagram. I, I was reading some Frank stories as well as Jack Kirby's OMAC. So if you want an elevator pitch, there it is. It's Frank meets <laughs> OMAC. <laughs> so, That's awesome. <laughs> more, more specifically, Manhog meets OMAC though. <laughs> but 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 I mean, just as as an inspiration source, not that you're yeah trying to recreate. Yeah, yeah. there's no specific story or, or any specific element in there um, other than the build of friends. I've had this idea for Kankor being in this suitcase like box uh, for a while, so I want to work that into the story. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's it's just the general spirit of those comics I want to put forth in this new story. And so I just want to say, like, for anyone um, who hasn't read Kanker, or they should. I mean, it is, it does really push against what you've read in the past. And it's funny. It's actually, there's some really, really funny stuff in there. And there's like, there's that one, I don't want to give it away, but there's that one page story towards the back he puts on the human, the human face, uh -huh. the human mask. And it, it's just like, it has everything that you want in a comic. And it, I think it perfectly is, it's a perfect example of what you can do in the comics medium. And because there, it, it is very special and unique and you really, really lean into that. And you really push the medium of comics to where it can go. And I'm always a, a fan of that so and you stole that try and before we go oh, oh did i <laughs> well I, I was gonna say yeah the the human tears human mask gag alone is is worth the price of it. <laughs> but um yeah I, I was genuinely laughing out loud when i when i <laughs> Um, I did get a review when the when the single issues were coming out. The um, there's an Australian podcast that I enjoy called uh, Radioactive Lounge, and uh, one of the guys on the show is is a fan of the book. But he did say he's like I like the the funnier earlier stuff better than this. So you know it, it it's it could use some more humor. I think I, I think I will inject even more into the next one. Oh, cool, cool. That's awesome. So um, lastly, I've been asking. I've been asking. Oh, sorry, Cam. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You're good. As I say, I've been asking everyone that we've had on to recommend a book. It doesn't have to be recent. It doesn't have to be a comic. It could be a novel. Uh, just something that they really, really, really dig. Um, and you know, maybe they go back to me. Maybe they don't. But Matt, were you able to dig something up? Yeah, I. Uh... The book I'm going to recommend is very expensive, so just a warning to anybody who's going nice. to think, think it, oh, I'm going to rush, rush out. And, Ooh la la. Uh, uh, but it's the the recent uh, Fantagraphics collection of Robert Williams paintings. The um, I think it's called The Father of Exponential Imagination. It's got everything in it. It's oversized. It's, I think, 10 by 13. This book weighs probably... 15 pounds so cam could work out with it um <laughs> but i i had lost touch with robert williams for a long time i was big into his work in the 90s as most people were and uh this book uh just sucked me in uh, i got it um for my birthday and uh 
It's beautiful. It's just a, a beautifully composed book. Um, the reproductions are fantastic. The way it's laid out, all of his writings about the particular period in his life and, and that particular period that he was making a, a certain type of painting. Uh, it's just fascinating. And um, he's a, he is a cartoonist. I, I think of him more as a cartoonist yeah. than a painter. I mean, he's a brilliant, classically uh, representative painter, but... Uh, he is making cartoons, uh, just, you know, big, giant, full color, oil painted cartoons. And uh, he's, it's just brilliant, brilliant stuff. That's awesome. very cool. And I mean, Fantagraphics puts out beautiful books. So, yeah. Is it, so, but it is available. It's just a little on the pricey side. Yeah, right now, I think Fantagraphics might, they were just having this like a 25% off sale or 20% sale on the book. I think the cover price is 150 Okay. Uh, I got it off Amazon just because my mother-in-law had given me an Amazon gift card, and so I think on Amazon it's like one twenty-five right now. Okay, uh, US, U.S. on that. So, um, but it, I mean the the size of the book and with what it contains, one hundred and fifty dollars. Like if it was a Tashin book, Tashin would have charged five hundred bucks. Oh me. yeah, of course. And, but it would be <laughs> it would be, the It'd be even bigger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, awesome, Cam. Do you have anything to finish up? Uh, yeah, just um, one thing to add. Um, well, and there's a couple of questions asked earlier. Dylan had asked about the sketched editions of Cancor, Matt, and um, when those might be coming out again. If they're coming out again, um, meaning the the, hit, the colored head sketches, if you're going to do those again. Um, I need to come up with a better method of making those sketches because the Copic markers, I think we talked about last time, they dried out pretty quickly. So I was only able to get maybe 20 of those small sketches done before <laughs> all my markers dried out. Oh, and shit. those markers are very expensive. So I just haven't got the the uh, refill uh, ink. Watercolor? Have you tried watercolor? That's my plan. I feel like I'm better off just, you know, buying a nice watercolor set and doing that instead. So uh, there's potential for that. And some of my, um, you know, I, I'd like to do daily warm up uh, uh, experiments with the watercolors. So they may not be part of the book, but it may be something that eventually I'll work with you, Cam, on making those available to collectors, uh, just, you know, the, the drawings themselves. <clears throat> And possibly getting more books from, uh, excuse me, from Chris at Ad House. And we could do something like that. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice. Oh, no, that's, that's good. Yeah, no, I think those were great. Um, and speaking of which, um, Matt's commission list is opening next week. So everyone stay tuned for that. Uh, I'll, I'll leave it vague right now, but next week, uh, make sure on the mailing list. We all know what kind of commission work Matt's been doing. It's been uh, absolute batshit crazy awesome. So um, next week's your chance to get, get on the list if you missed out on the last one. And this one's for you, Troy. Uh, have you ever been as mad at not getting a request as you did for this crazy cat piece that went to Matt? <laughs> no, because it came back around. So it's all good. <laughs> it did. Okay. <laughs> I was I was mad this morning though when I when uh, the the dagger dagger announcement came out and I wasn't asked to be in it. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I, saw I raised I raised some friendly hell. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw that. that. Uh, oh, but there but, was some there was some DMs too. <laughs> no, it's all good because I know I know everyone involved. But yeah, I was like, next time. Funded within five hours, so so that's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they needed to ask for more, if you ask me. But <laughs> no, that's that's it for for us guys. We got some big stuff coming up this week, and we'll be doing uh, a more consistent. We, we haven't done a lot of live streams lately, but the Wednesday, and we'll get back to another day of the week. I don't know if we're going to do Saturday. Um, we have some other ideas. Uh, and Troy and I will talk about that uh, later on, but we'll we'll be throwing yeah. a lot more. Uh, your guys' way, um, yeah. The, and the plan is to the plan is to talk to Rossi next week if if everything lines up. So, oh, cool. Yeah, 
I excited for that. And um, yeah, that's thanks for everyone who, who joined in. Thanks to Troy and Matt, as always. Not only are you guys amazing artists, you're uh, uh, great, uh, great to chat with too. So um, thanks for coming on, guys. Well, thank you, Cam. Thanks, thanks everybody. Troy. Appreciate thanks, it. Good night. Thank you, guys.